I love capitalism because I think it's the best system for poor people. In the last three decades, more than one billion people all over the world came out of extreme poverty. In 24 socialist experiments in the last hundred years. What they all had in common, they all failed. More than 50% are pro-socialist today. Hello and welcome to another episode of Room for Thought. Today I've got someone who's flown in all the way from Germany. Someone who believes passionately in the power of capitalism and who's unashamedly pro-free market. Rainer Zetterman, thank you very much indeed for coming in and joining us. Yes, thank you for inviting me. Now tell me, why, why do you love the free market? Why do you love capitalism? I love capitalism because I think it's the best system for poor people. I think the strong people, they don't need capitalism because they come around everywhere, in every system, everywhere in the world. But I think for poor people, this is the great system, and a lot of people don't know it, in the last three decades, more than one billion people all over the world came out of extreme poverty. And I think it's amazing, and people don't know it. They speak about the bad sides of capitalism, it's a dirty word for them, and uh, I love capitalism because I think it's the best system for poor people. So you think the moral case, it's the great engine of, of elevation. It, it, it raises up living standards for the, the poorest, not just in the West, but in, in, in the third world. Yes, take an example of China. This is, uh, you know, this book, The Power of Capitalism. Yeah. The first chapter is about China. It's a very good book. Um, details at the bottom of the screen soon on where to buy it. And uh, you, you can order it in uh, Amazon. Uh, le le let's start with, with China as an example for the power of capitalism, because this is uh, also the first chapter of this uh, book. In the end of the 50s, what a lot of people don't know, 45 million people in China died as a result of Mao's so-called Great Leap Forward. So China in the 1950s, basket case, poor and socialist. Yes, and uh, now this was the biggest socialist experiment in the whole history, and uh, I have lectures all over the world about this topic in Germany, and I've been in Korea, in the United States, and, and, and everywhere, and I asked these young people, have you heard about this at school, about this big socialist experiment? The Great Leap Forward. No, they, they didn't hear about it. But that. When, when Mao started off the Great Leap Forward, he consciously set out to catch up and overtake with capitalism. He said that by, by adopting these policies, collectivizing the land, yes. implementing a planned economy, he said, we're gonna, we're gonna overtake capitalism. What, what actually happened? What actually happened? That, uh, so that in the result, so many people died because of starvation, some were killed because of starvation, hung, hunger there. This was the result of this ex experiment. So mass starvation, yes. famine, Yes. I, I, I know in your book you spoke to a, a Chinese, well, a Hong Kong Chinese historian, Yang Jusan, and he, he catalogued some of the, the extraordinary human misery that. that yes, it, uh, it's, it was so um, terrible. It was even cannibalism in this, uh, in this time. You have to read it all. Uh, all this. It's, a, it's a very sad story. But, but let me make my point what happened. Even in 1981, 88% of the population of China, of Chinese people, lived in extreme poverty. This is according to official data of World Bank, 88%. Today it's, today it's less than 1%, according to the same data, from 88% mm -hmm. to less than 1%. Mm -hmm. And the question I give the answer to is, what happened? What is the reason? Uh, to, to give it in absolute numbers, almost 880 million people came out of extreme poverty in this time. This ne ha happened never before in history. And most people don't understand what was the reason. The reason is very simple, because they implemented um, private property and more market. 1981, uh, it was only allowed to have not more than seven employees in a, in a private-owned company. There were almost no private-owned uh, companies. And today, you know, we have this big, big companies like 
Alibaba, Alibaba cancelled it, all this with this uh, Chinese uh, billionaire. It'd be, it'd be hard to think of the world today without some of these private Chinese companies. I mean, um, yes. smart mobile phone makers. And, uh, Ab absolutely, for us in Xiaomi, it would be a disaster, yes? Yeah. It would be a disaster. So, and I think this is a, a good example what private property and markets can do for the poor people. But this is extraordinary. 1980, 81. It's it's not that long ago. I mean, I was I was yes. I was a kid then. But you know, a China a China that could barely feed itself. But you know, sitting here looking at the cameras that are recording this, three of them, every single one of them, technically sophisticated piece of equipment, every single one of them is made in China. I mean, that's extraordinary. It's, it's gone from being a country that couldn't produce enough rice to one that sells brilliant cameras yes. like the ones recording this. Absolutely. And another thing what is important, today critics of capitalism, they claim always about uh, the gap between the poor and the rich and you know this is their topic, equality mm -hmm. is their topic. But I've been in China, I had lectures in five Chinese cities exactly one year ago and I asked all these people there in the audience, who is better off than your parents have been 30 or 40 years ago. And everyone raised his hand. And if I would have asked them, who would like to go back to socialist times because it was you people were more equal, I wouldn't ask them because, uh, because they would think that I'm crazy if I ask such a question. So this is the message. This Equality is not the most important. It's a really interesting point. You're saying that young people in, in China and that part of the world, Korea, are, are very aware of the fact that life's got a lot better yes. and it's due to reform and the free market. But one of the reasons why I think you wrote your book, and you, you certainly at the beginning start talking about this, um, in the West, in America, in Britain, in Europe, young people actually don't, don't have that appreciation. They, they, in fact, there is an opinion poll in America that showed I think 45% of young Americans said they were pro-socialism. Yes, uh, I have even bigger numbers, more than 50% are pro-socialist today. I think they have only a very vague idea what socialism really means. They dream about this um, so-called Nordic socialism, what uh, maybe in, in uh, Sweden or Denmark. But this is another chapter of my book. Maybe we'll come, we can, we'll come on to talk we about We can talk later about yeah. it. Is, or, but but the, uh, people in the West, they don't understand the reasons for the success in China, they don't understand what happened there. They think that China is an example for this, what they call third way between communism and capitalism, uh -huh. with a characteristic of a big influence by the state. And this is exactly wrong, because the, there, there is a big influence of the state today. But this is only because they came from 100% state and then they reduced the power of the uh, state. And uh, all their success, I spoke with one of the leading Chinese economists who was involved in the pricing reforms. His name is Chang Wai, and by the way, he wrote a fascinating book, The Logic of the Market. I can recommend it to, to everyone and if you read it. And uh, when I spoke with him, I understood he always repeated one sentence. Our success was not because of the state, but in spite of the state. It was not because of the state, but in spite of the state. And this is what people in the West don't understand. And the problem is that I have doubts whether the Chinese politi politicians understand it today. You're saying there's this sort of lazy view of China, which is to say that the, the communists took over in, what, 48, 49, um, 2019, look how well China's done, this is because of communism. Actually what you're saying is not, not, not the case. There was the first 30 or 40 years, 49 to 79, when they tried real socialism and it failed. Actually it's only since the early 80s when they moved to capitalism that you get this great takeoff. Ab absolutely, this uh, two absolutely It's a tale of two Chinas. Absolute, uh, two, two, two China, two absolute different periods, yes. Uh, up to, uh, if, if someone asks me, when started the big change in the world, uh, the, the uh, success of the fight against poverty. I can give you exact date. It was September 1976, 
because 76. then Mao Zedong died. <laughs> the death of Chairman Mao. Yeah. This is a really interesting point. I read the chapter on China, and if there's one slight criticism I would have of that chapter, you, you imply that Deng and the ruling elite set out to change China by, by design. You talk about how they sent envoys abroad to see what they were doing in Singapore and Germany and the rest of the world. Is there not a case to say that actually, actually, it wasn't Deng doing things by design. It was, it was accident. It was yeah, a group of peasant farmers in, I think, uh, Anhui province who started privatizing the land. It was, it was officials during the chaos of the Cultural Revolution who just started doing their own thing that created, in effect, the special economic sense. Is there not an argument that, it, far from being capitalism by design, actually China got there by accident? I think if you read it one more time, you will find that uh, I support exactly this argument. But these are two things. First, you are absolutely right, and a lot of people don't understand it. It was uh, spontaneously development. Mm -hmm. What happened in uh, rural districts of mm -hmm. China when people, um, when 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 uh, when they when the uh, influence of the state was reduced and private uh, property was involved. And so this was a spontaneous development on the one hand. But on the other hand, it was necessary that there is one in the government who didn't stop this. You know, right. If this would have happened uh, to Mao's time, the Communist Party, the Communist Party would have stopped it. Yeah. And so I think these were two things. Deng Xiaoping, he started with a, a re reforms. And he didn't call it capitalism. Even today, no one speaks about capitalism yeah. in China. When I've been there, they want we don't speak about capitalism. We don't like it here. Even there, it's a dirty word. But this is exactly what they've done. Yeah. They only changed the meaning of the word socialism, yes? They changed it to the, 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 the country. Maybe this made it easier for them to have this development. So uh, this is a big difference, I think, what happened in, in Russia and Soviet Union and in China. Because in Russia, they implemented something from the government, what they called free market or capitalism, and uh, in fact it was more than crony capitalism and with co uh, corruption. Yeah. And there was not this kind of grassroots movement yeah. that you had in China. And in China you had this spontaneous process on the one hand, and you had on the other hand this reforms by Deng Xiaoping who was to support it then. What about the future? Is there some evidence that Deng's reforms, I mean, certainly politically, he put constraints on the power of a small group within the upper echelons of the Communist Party. He, he I think, ended the idea of, uh, he brought in term limits for presidents and things. Those political reforms are being reversed. Is there any sign that some of his economic liberalization reforms are being reversed? Yes, I think there are in the last um, years, but you don't know what will be the outcome, but because it was always uh, changing in the last uh, decades. There were some periods with more economic reforms towards capitalism, and then there were always uh, other years when you had a backward uh, a movement uh, to more state, and I think now, this time, we are in the process uh, of... Uh, more influence of the state, uh, uh, again, even in the uh, economy. So it's hard to say what will be the outcome. But one thing is sure, only if the Chinese, if they don't forget what are, were the reasons of their success, only then this process, this positive process will go on. If they forget it, yes? Yeah. Uh, it's the same. Let me speak uh, maybe a moment about South Korea. We'll, we'll come on to that. Yes. When you talk about China, you compare two Chinas, um, China 49 to 79, China 79 to today. But then you've got these other examples where you're comparing countries that are separated not by time, but by geography. Korea's one, Germany's another. Yeah. I know they're different countries, but on opposite ends of the South American continent, Chile and, and Venezuela. Absolutely. Talk, I mean, you can't get perhaps a better human experiment than what happened on the Korean peninsula over the past... Years. Talk us through that. What, what, what happened in 48? Um, in, uh, let's talk about Korea. Yeah. Yes. Yes. What, what a lot of people don't know, you know, Korea was divided, like Germany was divided, uh, divided after the Second World War, 
in this northern part, we have this uh, Korea War, we had this northern part with uh, communism, with planned economy, mm -hmm. and we had uh, then South uh, Korea with a, a capitalist. I think it's th this way it was similar to Germany, where we had uh, East Germany with communism and West Germany uh, with, uh, with capitalism. So both cases, a single country by accident and geopolitics, they're, they're separated. One is run as capitalist, one is run as communist. And, and so it's an experiment because I think you can compare it because sometimes they, people ask, can you compare it? Maybe it's a question of culture. Maybe yeah. they have different history, a different culture. It's hard to compare. But here is, uh, you know, the people with the same culture, background, with the same history. And the only difference is the economic system. And uh, what a lot of people don't know, even in the 60s, Korea, North Korea and South Korea was as poor as the poorest African countries are today, as poor as the poorest African countries are today. This was in the 60s. But then uh, South Korea started with a capitalist way, free market, mm -hmm. capitalism. Mm -hmm. And today, you know, my TV at home, it's LG, it's from Samsung. Samsung. Uh, it's, it's from Korea. And, and I've been there and I've spent there a time in a hotel and then uh, down in the hotel. Uh, I was in a shopping mall, and the shopping mall was so amazing. I've never seen it in Europe. Yeah. It was. Uh, oh, one thing that struck me reading the chapter on Korea, I always thought of as Korea rather condescendingly as a middle income country. You realize, no, it's not a middle income country at all. It's a rich, it's, it's you know, up to um, UK, US, you know, standards. And it's $27,000 a year uh, is the average income. It's a, it's a very wealthy place. And what, what, you know, North Korea is not just grim. But I mean, they, they they murder their own people when they try and escape. It's 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 a it's a it's a, it's yes, a this, is, this is a funny thing as well. If I discuss with socialists, I tell them always, uh, please, I ask them always, please tell me about a country where people move from a capitalist to communist country. Show me the people who move from South Korea to North Korea, or show me people who move from. Miami to Cuba, yeah. or show me people who moved from uh, Western Germany to Eastern Germany. There, there must have at one time been a madman or a... a, a, a there a, are some madmen, for example, the father of Angela Merkel. He was so mad, yes. He, he moved from... R really, exactly. No yes, way. <laughs> yes, he, 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 he moved from, from West Germany to East Germany. What, so what, what on earth possessed him? Was he a... It, it was something wrong with him, and it's, I think it's something wrong with her as well. You don't think it's hereditary? <laughs> yes, yes. So, it's, exactly, there but, were some madmen, but, but it's generally so, because people try to move or now see the current example i um uh, some month ago i spoke in germany with the ambassador of, of chile yes and he told me about the the, the, the refugees who come there even in, in his country but but sure about colombia uh, this is another chapter maybe later we can talk about it uh, 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 mm -hmm. today more than 10 percent of the population of venezuela are refugees from Venezuela to other uh, South American countries. Yes, a tenth of the population of Venezuela yes, is flat. absolutely. And there's I, I have no one going from Chile to Venezuela. But this is the interesting thing. You know, you've got Germany and Korea. When they were divided, they both they were both much the same. And you've seen this, you know, one, one, one flourish, one stagnate. What's interesting, I think, in the example you give about Chile and Venezuela is it, it's even worse than that. Chile in the 1960s is pretty poor. Venezuela in 1970, I think, is the 20th richest country in the world. Absolutely. This was one of the richest countries. And they crossed over. Yes. This, uh, Venezuela was one of the richest countries in the world. And then they started with a lot of uh, labor market regulation, minimum wages and all this. This was not real socialism, but they started with all this regulation, uh, especially labor market regulation. And then... You know what, what happened then in the um, in 1999 when Hugo Chavez came to power mm -hmm. and all the socialists and leftists all over the world were so enthusiastic and uh, fascinated. Here in Britain. Like Jeremy Corbyn, I yeah. know all these quotes 
were, he was so fascinated. They held it up as an example of real socialism in action. There was, there yes, was praise. They, called, they, 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 they called it socialism of the 21st uh, century. I, I think you may even quote Barbara Walters in America as saying, you know, how, how what a wonderful job they're doing for helping poor people and all that. Yes, and even in uh, where I live in uh, Berlin, we had one, he was a uh, uh, secretary of uh, state here in Berlin, and he wrote uh, books about uh, Venezuela and housing policy in Venezuela, and uh, he recommended us in Germany, uh, and even the leftist party did it, that we could follow this example what uh, in, in Venezuela. So now we know what happened today. There's no place in the world with a higher inflation rate than in Venezuela. I don't know how high is it to tell. I think it's even hard to measure, maybe more than one million percent. And I mean, talking about inflation is, is a bit abstract. This is a country where people, they, they, they don't have enough food. So that yeah, they, they, so starvation. They, 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 have, they have hunger. They, they die from hunger and they are oppressed. But now the, the funny trick with socialism. First, they praised it, like I mentioned, socialism 21st century. After it failed, they have always two explanations. First, it was only the fault of bad U.S. imperialism because of their uh, sanctions and uh, these things. They blame they, America. Yeah, they, they tell the same with uh, North Korea. So, but this means implicitly that if there were be no sanctions from uh, from uh, America, that it would be a great uh, economy. I'm against the sanctions, even on this for this reason, because yeah. then you you. Uh, take away any possibility yeah. of an excuse uh, for that. But the next thing... But they were failing. I mean, Korea, uh, yeah. um, North Korea and Venezuela were failing long before American sanctions came. Yes, and, and the next thing they will tell you, oh, sorry, it was not real socialist. It was not... And that's the same story they tell every time. I think you had this interview with Christian Nimitz about yes. this. A uh, great book I recommend everyone to read. My book and his book, in addition to this, and you have everyone that you have to know yeah. about socialism, the failed idea that never dies. If, if you read this book by Christian Lewis about socialism, the failed idea that never dies, mm -hmm. he calculated that there were more than or exactly 24 socialist experiments in the last 100 years. And um, what they all had in common, they all failed mm -hmm. without any exception. And I give you an example, and I think it's a funny example. Think about a housewife who will bake cake. And the guests, they will get sick because of the cake. Next week, she invites next guests, she will bake the cake, but with a little uh, modification of the recipe because she saw something was not right, and there's a modification. But what happens again, guests will sick. The next week, they invite again guests. Did the guests keep cake. coming? <laughs> yes, they, 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 they come. Yes, hopefully they Maybe come. Maybe it's a socialist but, 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 country, they, they have no choice. They, maybe not the same guests. Maybe other, she, she will always find other guests, not the same. Um, and then what happens? She always a little modification of the recipe because she saw that something was not okay, but the result is the same guests were wrong. And then she would do it 24 times, and 24 times the same result gets wrong. Do you think there's any housewife in the world that is so stupid? I'm sure there is no one who would do it. Mm -hmm. She would realize, maybe after a second or a third time, that it's the recipe that was wrong. And this is always the bad idea of socialists. They tell you always the idea was perfect, only the realis realization was not. And this was exactly the same, uh, what happened in the 50s in Germany, mm -hmm. after the end of National Socialism. There were polls, and the majority of uh, Germans stated National Socialism was a great idea, only in practice it was not realized in the right way. Stupid, it was not a great idea. The idea was wrong, and this is what socialists don't understand. But here's the thing, you're, you're from Germany, yeah. and presumably you grew up in the West. Yes, sir. You must know people who grew up in the East. Is there anyone with a sort of living memory of what it was like who ever praises socialism? I mean, why are there people in Germany today, given that experience, who so, so, contemplate to, to, socialism? To, to be honest, there are people 
especially in East Germany, who want socialism uh, back. But no one will tell you, I want to go back to uh, a, a, a GDR, uh, then to the system. But they want a, a, another kind of socialism. And this is always what, uh, you know, the big misunderstanding. I think even we have in Germany a party, the, the leftist party is the former communist party. They, this party changed their name for three times and people, uh, maybe they, they hope that they don't remember, but it's the former communist party. They rule now in the city where I live together with Green Party and well, Social why, Democrats. Why do people put them in office? Yes, uh, because they will tell you, no, no, we don't want the system back from German Democratic Republic. It was not all wrong, but there was no de democracy. And it will be different this and, time. And, and it will be different with democracy. But what they don't understand, it's not only a question of democracy or not. It was the economic system that yeah. failed. And what they suggest now as a solution for our problem uh, is exactly the same idea that the socialists had in former East Germany. I will give you one example. In the last years, we had uh, the, the rents in uh, where I come from in Berlin were uh, rising, uh, the house prices. And now what do they do? They will they make now a rent stop from the, from the government. So they cap the rents. Uh, they, it, you are not allowed in the next five years to have any increase in the rent, if they will force you, if you have a rent, maybe you agree on maybe 15 euros to reduce it, to, to reduce it even. Can I, can I just guess what may happen? The availability of rental property is going to decline. <laughs> and, 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 it's, it's so and, obvious. And it happened in, and this is what I want to say, the same thing happened in uh, East Germany. Yeah. This rent stop, it's not a new idea. I can tell you who had this idea. It was Adolf Hitler in the 30s. He was Socialism first, in the 30s. Yes, it was the first one with rent stop. And then after the end of the Second World War, then in East Germany, the communists, they took the, uh, only with a little modification, the law from Adolf Hitler with rent stop. And it was till the end of, and, and the rents were very low. But what happened there was uh, uh, that the, the, they, they had no money for maintenance and so of course. And all these buildings were in such in incredible ba ba bad shape. They, they had to, uh, it, it was almost not possible to, 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 to live in there. And you had to wait for maybe 10 years even to, 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 to get a, a simple uh, apartment at this. And they tell you every time after socialism failed. And uh, the special thing in my book is I don't discuss about any theory, whether this theory is better or the other theory, but I think we can compare today everything. I mean, this is also compelling. You, it's not a book with a lot of theorizing, as you say. You, you take practical examples. You show what's actually happened in Korea, what's actually happened in Germany, what's actually happened in China. Um, I, I want you to then slightly sort of move on and see if we can draw a couple of broader conclusions. When, when you talk about the example of Venezuela and Chile, both of them are quite interesting because both of them are taken over by a military strongman. In the case of Chile, it's, it's Pinochet. Um, in the case of Venezuela, it's, um, it's um, uh, Hugo Chavez. Pinochet happens, though, even though he's a dictator, to introduce lots of free market reforms. He imports ideas from the Chicago University, the so-called Chicago Boys. They liberalize the economy. Venezuela moves in the opposite direction. The strong man in charge moves to a socialist model. So my question is, do you have to have democracy to have capitalism? Or, or could you say that actually too much democracy inhibits uh, free market economics? I think if you look in the last 200 years, in the most cases, uh, we had a combination of democracy and capitalism. Mm -hmm. And in the most cases we had a combination of dictatorship and socialism. Mm -hmm. We had some examples of what you call democratic socialism. Mm -hmm. I have two chapters in the book about Sweden and about UK, mm -hmm. which was democratic socialism also, but they, they, they failed. But in most cases this was a combination of dictatorship 
and uh, socialism and democracy and capitalism. But there are exceptions. And one exception is uh, in, when the economic reforms in South Korea started. I think it wasn't a real democracy like what we would call Not until the 80s, I think. Democracy, yeah. yes. And uh, the second example that what you were talking about is uh, uh, with, with uh, Pinochet in, uh, in uh, Chile and even China. We talked about China. It's a dictatorship today from the Communist Party. And also you've got Singapore. I mean, I, I think Singapore's Singapore. very free market, Dubai, very free market. But in China, they combine now some forms of capitalism, yes, with dictatorship. So I think um, in, in a lot of cases, there is a relationship between both. Look what happened in uh, Chile. First were the pro-market reforms by this uh, Chicago boys, but what happened in the next step that uh, uh, Pinochet had uh, to uh, step away, he made a referendum. Mm -hmm. He thought the referendum would be pro him, but it was against him. I think yeah. one of the uh, single uh, uh, examples in uh, history where, where a dictator uh, 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 had stepped down as a result of a referendum mm -hmm. that, that he made. And I think uh, Pinochet was a cruel uh, dictatorship on the one uh, hand, with uh, terrorism against people and charge and so on. But on the other hand, there were these economic reforms. We had uh, different parties ru ruling there in Chile, some more left, some more center-right parties. Mm -hmm. But in all cases, more or less, they believed mm -hmm. in uh, pro-market. This was the same what happened in uh, UK after Thatcher when Tony Blair was so intelligent to go on with the reforms by uh, Maggie Thatcher and not to, uh, uh, and not to, 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 yeah. to, to reverse it. Yeah. Or the same what happened in the United States after, uh, um, uh, after the end of Reagan with his economic reforms mm -hmm. that uh, Bill Clinton was so, so uh, clever not to, to reverse all this process. And this was the same what happened in Chile. Now, one of the things I found really interesting about the book was the sort of Scandinavian socialist myth. I, I always grew up thinking that actually, yes, it's all very well having Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher introduce free market reforms in the UK. And yes, they were successful, but there was always this repudiation and rebuttal of that in the form of supposedly Scandinavian socialism. Talk, talk, talk us through that. You, you actually say that on the contrary, Sweden was socialist only for a brief period in the 70s. It wasn't very successful and actually they've been pretty free market ever since. Yes, and it's an uh, underestimation if you say it wasn't very successful. It was a great disaster what happened there. And you can find all the facts in my book that it was an absolute disaster what, what happened there. With this uh, high taxes, I have uh, some uh, kind of uh, funny uh, stories what happened there. For example, maybe you know this famous uh, uh, um, uh, uh, writer, Astrid Lindgren, uh, who wrote books for, for uh, uh, children. Yeah. And she was social democrat, and it was in the 70s. And one time she checked how many taxes she had to pay. And believe it or not, the result was... 102 percent. She was paying more tax than yes, her. Yes, 102 percent. And then she wrote an article in one of the biggest uh, Swedish newspapers uh, about this uh, this taxes. And the financial minister, he said, she's wrong. She she should go on writing their fairy tales, but she can't calculate. She don't understand anything about taxes. But he was wrong. And even the Prime Minister Olaf Palme then of Sweden, he had to apologize in TV and tell Astrid Green was correct, it was 102%. So crazy, or maybe you know uh, um, IKEA with this uh, furniture yes. uh, company. I'm a big fan of IKEA. Yes, and the, the founder there, Ima Kamprat, uh, uh, he, he, he was a refugee as well at this time. First, he went to Denmark, but it was much better. He was a tax refugee. A tax yes, it was a tax refugee. And in the last uh, decades, he lived in Swiss as the richest man of uh, Europe, and he only came uh, back uh, some years before he died. And, and, you know, this was a big disaster, but the Swedish people were clever and they saw it. And they made a lot of economic reforms. And if people tell me today 
we want to have the system that we have in Sweden. Yes. Then I ask them some questions. First, the first thing you should do, abolish every kind of wealth tax because they, they, they don't have it. The next thing, abolish every inheritance tax because they don't have they it. They scrapped inheritance tax. Yes, they, 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 they don't have it. What is true uh, concerning the income tax? They have very high income taxes. But if you compare the economic freedom in Sweden with the United States, you know, there's every year this Index of Economic Freedom by Heritage Con Con uh, uh, Foundation uh, with a rating of all countries all over the world, uh, how economic free they are. And if you compare today the, the numbers in the rating for United States mm -hmm. and for Sweden, it's the same. Yeah. So this is no, not an example for, for a socialist country. They have been, this is correct, in the 70s. But then they did similar things like Margaret Thatcher did here in, uh, to, uh, ex ex especially to reduce taxes and to reduce welfare state and to reduce labor market regulation. After reading two thirds of your book, it's pretty obvious to me that, you know, socialism in countries like Venezuela, you know, they promise paradise, people end up having to feed their pets. Socialism in uh, Sweden is a disaster, it's a short lived disaster. And it creates this sort of um, exodus from Sweden of, of wealth creators and, and talented authors and writers and entrepreneurs and the rest, and they have to abandon it. But still, you get people in Britain today who say socialism is the answer and who cheer Jeremy Corbyn as though he's sort of something new and different and innovative. And when you challenge them on this, they always go back to the, the banking crisis, the financial crisis. They say, look, look at what happened in 2007, 2008. Capitalism isn't working. What's your response to that? I think this is one of the most important chapters in my book about the financial crisis because there is a misinterpretation of the financial crisis. The interpretation that you can hear every day in media and from politicians and from intellectuals is that the cause of the financial crisis was uh, deregulation, and failure of the market and so on. And it's a very complicated uh, thing, but I have in this chapter a lot of evidence that the contrary is true. First, it was a result of the policy of the central banks. Central bankers? Yes. Who are planners for interest yes, rates. This has absolutely nothing to do with uh, uh, capitalism. Yeah. On, the, on the contrary, they, they act like uh, uh, in the plant uh, economy, and uh, they, they do it today even worse than they did at. Uh, they literally the, price fix this interest price. rates. Yes, they, uh, they uh, uh, abolish the prices for interest rates, and this is uh, exactly the contrary of what you call free market and what you call capitalism. And the, the other thing was that they had their um, uh, regulations by the government uh, in favor of minorities to force financial institutions to give loans for housing to people. This is subprime in America. This, yes, who should, yeah. should they, they should never give them a, a, a loan. And this was the start of that, what you call the subprime crisis. Yeah. The subprime crisis was the reason for the financial so, crisis. So you have these two key interventions. You have politicians in Washington saying, you've got to allow people in Alabama to buy a shack and that pushes the price of shacks and trailer parks in Alabama up beyond the ability of those people to repay it. So inevitably they default and, and, and you get that. But you've also got this more profound failure of the financial system where you've got basically governments and central banks creating lots and lots of cheap credit. And so this means that it's not just people in Alabama borrowing money to invest in an asset. You get hedge fund managers, you get everyone doing it. So you get this huge surge in, 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 in the misallocation of money and capital. Yes, and uh, this is what, um, what I'm thinking about. Today they do it in the same way like they did it before. It's even worse today, you know. If you look for the debt, not in Germany, but most countries in the world, especially the United States and most companies, we have more debt in the world than we had at the beginning of the financial crisis. Yep. And we have the same 
uh, even worse policy of the central bank with this uh, zero interest rates and with this uh, um, uh, all these mistakes that, that, that they make. And so I think and I believe the financial crisis isn't over. Yeah. It's not something a lot of people speak about it like something that happened in the past or they speak about even the euro crisis as something that happened in the past. These problems are still there. But it, it's still there. Yeah. And I can give you a thought experiment. If you would uh, increase only the interest rates today to maybe 2 or 3%, what would happen? 2 or 3% is historically very low. Yes, and it's very low. But even if you would, it, it would be a total disaster. And this is the name I give you an example for truck, uh, people who are addicted on trucks or on uh, alcohol. Mm -hmm. If you give him uh, uh, a shot of whiskey or, or another shot of uh, methadone, maybe, he will stop shaking. Yeah. And then we'll tell, oh, he stopped shaking. He seems to be healthy. He's cured. Give no, him a vodka. He's cured. <laughs> no, take away this vodka. Yeah. Take away this interest yeah. rate. And then you will see what happens with, with him. Well, but, 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 but your question was, why do people believe in the socialism as yes, like Jeremy Cogan? Why, especially uh, young people? Because, uh, there's not easy answer, but one answer is the trick of the socialist. They don't do this what I do in my book. They don't compare things that you can compare, but they compare utopia with the reality. And then the outcome is always negative for utopia. I give you an example. Uh, if you are married, for example, and this is always a funny question, I ask people if I give my lectures, I ask, ask them, have you, are, are you lucky in your marriage? Yes, we are. And then I ask them, would you be surprised you come home in the evening and your wife will tell you, we have to talk seriously. To be honest, I was at the journey it's about getting divorced. Are you sure? I would be surprised. And I tell her, what happened? She started to read this Roman's laugh novels. I think you call it Chiclet or something. Mills and Bloom. Chiclet. Chiclet. Yes, yes. Yeah. You, you call Romance. It. Yes. And they started to see how romantic is the laugh there. Yes. Every day in the morning. Even my, 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 my life is like something they, from the pages of Mills and Bloom. <laughs> yes, but it's always. It's every day they start breakfast with kissing and all this. Yes. And then your wife starts to compare this with your real marriage. Yes. Yeah. And then you would ask her, is, is it fair to compare our real marriage with yeah. this chiclet pleasure? No, fair is to compare your real marriage with maybe uh, uh, Sam and Paul and, and, your, and neighbors your, your, your parents, friends, your, 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 yeah. your neighbors and parents with their marriage. So this is what I do, and this is the great trick. Uh, and if someone tells me this is bad and capitalism, this is bad, the first question is always, please show me the alternative, but please don't show me any book. Yeah. Please don't show me any theory. Mm -hmm. Show me any place in the world where mm -hmm. it works or where it had worked in the last 10 mm -hmm. years. And they can't show me. They only speak about their books and about their theory. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's a very, very powerful point. I mean, intellectuals as well, um, you know, we talk about public intellectuals. I mean, the, the word intellectual is, a, I, I think, in the English language, rather a dirty word, and rightly so. But you get, in academia, you get people who make programs to the BBC, and they have this, this bias in favour of ordered societies, of, of, in effect, socialism, and this prejudice against the idea of spontaneous design. Why, why, why do you think intellectuals favour socialism? What is it about it? I think this is the most important uh, chapter in my book, and so I appreciate that you're talking about it, and it's a little bit of a complicated thing. On the one hand, on the other hand, it's very easy, but uh, let me say maybe it's only two points uh, today. For the other points, I recommend to, to read the book and the, the chapter. One thing is that um, the profession of these intellectuals is to, uh, to give drafts of theories and to construct things and so and so I think it's natural that uh, they have uh, attraction to socialists because socialism is something uh, a construction of theory and capitalism is not capitalism is something uh, that uh, came in our world 
as a result of a spontaneous mm -hmm. process. There was not someone like Adam Smith writing a book on capitalism, and then there was a government, and they told now you have to yeah. implement capitalism like Adam Smith wrote in his book. It just kind of happened. It, it, it just happened. And, and you don't need no intellectuals for this, but you need intellectuals with other theories for socialism. And everyone want to be needed. So this is but throughout history, people have done this. When when they see something they can't explain, um, lightning strikes when we lived in caves, or um, you know pestilence in the Middle Ages, people would invent this idea that there was some sort of grand design behind it. So I think I mean I, I just think as humans, it's counterintuitive to accept the world as self-designed. Yes, uh, you're right. It's always if people don't understand anything like it was in the Middle Ages that they look for scapegoats, for example, and they, uh, you know, then they, they blame Jewish people or they blame witches for this today. They blame greedy bankers for financial yeah. crisis if they don't understand it. And it's a conspiracy theory who had a plan. And, and if it's success, it must be because of politicians. Yes. Um, and then there's another point that is very important. Let's speak a little bit about my background. I can give you an example because I come from an uh, intellectual background, and you know I have two doctor degrees now, and so I'm. Uh, I'm, I'm You're one of these intellectuals. I, I, yes, I wrote uh, uh, um, uh, 23 books, and so I, I uh, and uh, I uh, um, I was teacher at the university here in Berlin, and so I think I'm an intellectual, but I'm an exception. But I come from a family as well where. It was very important how many books you read and how educated you, you are. And educated people and academics, they always believe the most important thing is how many books you have read. And then later in their life, they learn that there are some entrepreneurs, for example, who haven't read any books, not, not uh, as, as much as they have read. But in the result, they are much better off in their finances, economics. This is so right. I've, I've often wondered if intellectuals place value on non-material things, and they're slightly miffed when they find that actually entrepreneurs and wealth creators accumulate far greater value materially than Yes, and then they don't understand the world. They think it's uh, this is a... Um, an example of the failure of the market. Because it's unfair because my neighbor is richer than me. <laughs> yes, this is failure. That, and, and he has the, the, the nicer house, yeah. the bigger car, and what is worse, the prettier wife. Yeah. Yes? And so, and so something has to be wrong. And he left school at 16. How can this be right? Yes, <laughs> and, and, and this is one very important thing. I have another book, maybe we can speak about it yeah. in another interview. It's called The Wealth Elite. And there I understood uh, one very important thing of the success of rich people, especially entrepreneurs and investors. Let's, let's and, talk about that. Yes. Uh, we talk about both the success of rich people and the prejudice against them, because I know you've got another book that talks about that yes, as well. Yes, but what you have to understand in psychology, we distinguish between two ways to learn. The one you call explicit learning or academic learning, what you learn at school or university, book wisdom. Mm -hmm. And this is the only way of learning that intellectuals know or that they accept. But there's another way of learning. We call it in psychology implicit learning. Or you can call it learning by doing or school of life. It's mainly unconscious doing stuff. learning. Yes, for example, in this interviews that I had for this other book with 45 uh, super rich people, when they were young, a lot of them were competitive athletes. And so they, they learned a lot. They learned uh, how to win, but much, much more important, they learned how to uh, the, uh, act with failure uh, and with uh, backlash again. And then a lot of them were engaged in early entrepreneurial activities, especially in sales. Yes? And there they learned a lot. And if I ask them how they've been at school, what uh, what were the, the performance in school? There was absolutely no correlation between their performance at school on the one hand really? and their financial success on the other hand. On the contrary, there were some of the, the, the richest there of my interviews who even didn't graduate uh, at high school and they never saw a university. So passing exams wasn't part of their success? 
Yes, and and uh, uh, you know here in, in UK as well. I think Richard Branson. I think he left school with sixteen or seventeen uh, years, and uh, and um, he is a, a, a successful uh, uh, entrepreneur. And uh, I think there were other of his schoolmates who were much more successful at school and who earn no 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 money today. And this is the difference. What, what I want to talk about between this implicit learning and explicit learning. And intellectuals, they only understand their way to learn, this academic uh, learning. And I think this is one reason because why they don't understand how the world works and how capitalists work. And they think it's an example of the failure of the market if this uh, other, uh, maybe in, the, in school it was his neighbor and he had uh, bad uh, marks and today he has maybe 100, uh, he earns 100 more uh, pounds than, than, than uh, he has. And it's a kind of envy. It's funny you say that because I notice a lot of journalists in Britain talk about rising inequality. And yet, actually, if you study the data, there is no rising inequality. If anything, inequality has declined in Britain over the past 30 years. What I think they're talking about is the fact that journalists are no longer as well paid as they were. And, and it's basically the envy of a certain kind of middle-class Brit who resents the fact that they're no longer at the top of the oligarchy. That reminds me of a funny story. I met a journalist, he's intelligent and I liked him, but while this interview, he, he said to me, uh, I can tell you something, I hate money. Yes, And then I asked him, and you are broken? You, no, not directly, but you are not so wrong. How could you know it? If you hate money, money will hate you. Yeah. This is the problem. Yeah, yes. People who renounce property often don't have much to renounce. Yes. Yeah. Um, what do we do? Because you know, often I think you allude to the idea that maybe it's a it's a it's an attitude thing. Our attitude towards entrepreneurs, our attitude towards rich people, that's important, and that requires cultural change. It, it's often said that America is more entrepreneurial because they they're more appreciative of entrepreneurs. Um, but what what are the pro capitalist reforms that that we need? Um, if if we're going to stop this slide towards Corbynism in, in the UK, what do we need to do? Because I, mean, I think there are problems that the left identifies. There is a shortage of housing in this country. There, there, there is an injustice in banks being bailed out and rescued for their foolish investment choices. But what do we do if we're not going to have that full-blown socialism? Yes, I think uh, the, the, my answers are always the same. Look in history. Look what uh, they did in Sweden when socialism failed. Look what Maggie Thatcher, I, I know here in UK, maybe it's controversial, but uh, I think uh, people forget what uh, about the situation. What, uh, how was it here in the uh, 70s? People, intellectuals and lefties say she was controversial. She never lost an election. The ordinary people loved her. <laughs> and uh, yes, and, and uh, in, in the 17th, they, they called uh, UK the, the sick man of, uh, of uh, Europe. Maybe I, uh, I have a funny quote of someone who was there, a German one, who was there in the 70s. Who was maybe, in the UK in the 70s. Maybe, yeah. Yes, yes, maybe, maybe I've, I found the quote. And, and you have to remember uh, history. And uh, it was a German economist, and he visited UK in the late 17th as a young man. And I give a quote here. Uh, he remembers uh, feeling shocked by the terrible standard of living across the country. Many households lacked the appliances we had in our kitchen, utilities room, and living room at home. At the time, the UK was miles away from the standards I was used to do, uh, used to from home, or those I had privilege to experience a few years earlier as a high school student in the U.S. If it hadn't been for the memory of the Manish British soldier stationed close to my parents' house at the time, my first visit to the U.K might have made me wonder which country had actually won the war. Yes? Extraordinary. Yes. And that was in the late 70s. It was in the late 70s, before Mark Thatcher came. And I think a lot of people uh, for, for, forget it, uh, uh, what was the situation there. And it is worse what happens now in Germany. Uh, uh, I think uh, people here are not aware of it. But first, we changed, or Angela Merkel changed the energy industry from a free market industry in a total planned economy, which, which, which would be a total disaster. Uh, first, they, she abolished uh, 
um, you know, uh, nuclear power plants and then the next coal power, power plants. And it's a crazy green ideology what she does. And the next step, what the, she, she does now, or what the German government does, to change the automotive industry from free markets to a plant economy. So how has she done that with the, the motor car industry? Yeah, they give them a real regulation from Bristol. They tell them, they, 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 they give them what they have to produce, what kind of cars they have to produce. It's not longer by the consumer. For example, some years ago, Angela Merkel claimed that in 1920, one million people in Germany should have electric cars, but they didn't sell it. Yes, no, almost no one sold it. And then they gave subsidies from the state, gave everyone 4,000 euro to buy it, but people didn't buy it as so, well. So she has a clear idea of the future of the car industry, and she's trying to make it happen, but like all plans... But the consumers didn't do it. Yeah. And so they, as an alternative way, she did it now with Brussels, and they told that they are telling now to the companies what they have to produce. So, and this is exactly plant it's economy. Exactly. And and uh, no, it's not only about socialists. Uh, the socialists like uh, Jeremy Corbyn and this on one hand, but even the so-called uh, uh, center right party here that is uh, governing in, in Germany together with social democrats. But there's a spectrum. There's hardcore socialism, pure free market, no society is at either extreme, it's a spectrum. And you're saying that she's, within that spectrum, she's moving Germany from the free market capitalist end towards the socialist end. Yes, it's in, in, in the kind of uh, planned plan economy. And if you, have to, if you ask me what we should do, learn from history. I, I, there were a lot of examples. I start again with what did they do in China? Uh, I, I, uh, they, more market, more private property. I, for me, I, I give you an example. It's like a test tube, you know. In the test tube, you have two parts. You have the state and you have the market. Mm -hmm. And I see always what happened if you gave in this test tube mm -hmm. more market or more yeah. state. Yeah. And the examples are very clear. Venezuela gave more state, bad. Yeah. China, you gave more market, improved. Yeah. Then Sweden, after the 70s, more market, situation improved, yeah. yes. Yeah. Chile, you get more market situation improved. It's always the same. And so I think don't use any theory. And this is a point of criticism for me, also against some libertarians or some advocates of capitalism. They speak too much about theory. Yeah. I, I like this theory and the books from Ludwig Mises and Hayek, but it's 100 years ago and 50 years ago, 100 years ago, Ludwig von Mises, and it was great that he showed it why socialism will fail and why it can't work. It was amazing. Uh, you know, I think his book was written 1921. That's almost 100 years ago. But today, you don't have to argue with any kind of theory. Mm -hmm. But this is the special approach mm -hmm. of my book. Mm -hmm. Look what happened in practice. Look what happened in yeah. reality. And then you can learn what you have to do. Learn it from what happened in the past. So, um, Thank you for coming in and talking about it. I mean, it's uh, it's it's selling well. Yes, I think uh, especially in uh, South Korea, it's selling well. Yes, it was, it so was it's translated into Korean. Yes, true. It's translated in Korea, and it was number one from political books in in, uh, in Korea. And Fantastic. I hope it will sell well here as well. If everyone buys not only one book but five for all your socialist friends. Fantastic. Well, Rainer, thank you so much for coming in. Thank I really you. appreciate, I appreciate it. it. And thank I hope you come back and talk about your next book when you're next. Thank you. Thank you.